My suggestion is simply this. All that we cherish at the base of the great dream of America demands a dedication to the dignity of man, the God-given dignity of every human being. And what is the meaning of human dignity in our times and in our nation today? It means this, at the very least, that every human being be, be given equal opportunity to develop all those human qualities bound up in the wonderful expression of enjoying equal rights to life and to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness. And all Americans, whatever their race or color or religion or national origin, be given equal opportunity to participate in the political life of this nation by voting freely, North and South, by holding political office right across the land, that every American have the equality of opportunity to develop all his human talents through all levels of education, because education is the key to tomorrow and to performance. Please welcome Notre Dame Professor of Africana Studies and Political Science, Diane Penderhughes. Good afternoon. Father Hesburgh was an inspiration to many, and I want to spend some time talking to you about two people who helped inspire my own research. In 1977, after I finished working on my dissertation, which was on race and ethnicity in Chicago politics, there might be a few Chicagoans here, I would guess, <laughs> I decided to turn my attention toward race and ethnicity at the national level. I took a leave from teaching in 81, 82, and headed home to Washington, D.C. to engage in field work to see what black organizations were up to. I had grown up in southeast Washington in the 1950s in Anacostia, where every day I walked up the hill to elementary school. Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church and school looked out over the city, and you could see much of the nation's capital, including the Pentagon and the Washington Monument. My neighborhood and the city were majority black, but the Congress, dominated by the system of racial supremacy and by Southern politicians, refused to allow political participation uh, by the city's residents. 30 years later, I observed congressional hearings, track what organizations like the NAACP and the National Urban League, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, and others were doing, and met their representatives on the Hill. The Voting Rights Act had been passed in 1965 providing a powerful framework for protecting the right to vote and ensuring that southern states and jurisdictions could not, could not push back on those reforms. I learned um, that year on the Hill that a coalition of civil rights interest groups were working together to ensure that the Voting Rights Act, which had to be renewed on a regular basis and was due up in 1982, was strengthened, was renewed and was strengthened. It was and remains a complicated piece of legislation, and as you know, it remains very important even today. But in being there, walking the hills, walking the halls of House and Senate office buildings, visiting the hearings held um, on the legislation, I met two people whose ideas shaped the debate and marked my thinking for life. This is a Father Ted said event, and although I didn't know it at the time, Father Hesburgh's influence has shaped the legislative history of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Lonnie Guineer and Frank Parker were two attorneys involved in the legislative campaign to help the Congress think about how the Voting Rights Act might be revised. Both were creative and dynamic thinkers and litigators who pushed the Congress, but who also pushed the Civil Rights Coalition to broaden their protections for black voters. I spent time observing them, interviewing them in that year and in subsequent years. They taught me and introduced me to the challenges that they faced. Uh, Guineer was a NAACP legal defense attorney in charge of their voting rights work. She was a Radcliffe and Yale Law School graduate. She'd grown up in New York City. Um, she was the daughter of a Jewish mother and an academic father. Her father was Ewart Guineer was the first chair of African American Studies at Harvard. Which one? Pardon me? Which one was she up there? 
This is Rosa Parks on your left and Lonnie Guineer on your right. Uh, thank you for asking, but yeah, Guineer is on the right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so let's see. That's Frank Parker. Um, Guineer was a NAAC legal defense attorney. I mentioned she'd grown up in New York City. She, her mother was Jewish. Her father was, um, let me go back. Her father was the first chair of African American studies. Parker was older, although not as old as I remember thinking at the time. <laughs> Funny how that happens. Parker had worked for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights during the years when Father Ted was a member in 1966 to 68. But before Father Ted became a chair, he was chair 69 to 72. After he left the commission, he, he moved to Mississippi, moved to Jackson, Mississippi, um, and lived there and worked there for about 15 years as an attorney for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. He prosecuted, prosecuted a range of cases, including those discrimination dealing with discrimination in the state of Mississippi. He helped integrate the um, state, uh, state police, for example. He prosecuted cases involving discrimination in many different areas of life in Mississippi. For me, they stood out as the most innovative thinkers in the Civil Rights Coalition. Parker, who had worked in Mississippi for almost 15 years, pushed for the concept of majority black districts in the extension of the legislation, of the voting rights legis legislation. This was a controversial move. It grew directly from his experience um, doing field work, doing legal work in the southern states, but especially in Mississippi, where there were large concentrations of blacks, particularly on the western edge of the state along the Mississippi River, um, but who were divided. That is, the congressional legislative districts were drawn in such a way that those, vote, those black neighborhoods or black regions were split in order to minimize the possibility that they could elect a black representative. They intentionally tried to minimize the influence. So Parker pushed the coalition to use black size as a political resource. In other words, draw a district in a way that brings all of the black voters together. They pushed, they followed his guidance, and it was successfully incorporated into the 82 extension. Congress had to support it as well. Um, Senator Dole was part of that coalition, part of the agreement to, to do that. After the Supreme Court upheld that concept in the early 1980s, a congressional district was drawn to incorporate this black population. Mike Espy was elected to the se second congressional district in 1987. He was the first black elected in the state since Reconstruction. Guineer uh, was more flexible as a link legal thinker. She supported the concept of majority black districts, but also recognized that this wouldn't be appropriate in all cases, since not all blacks lived in areas where, that were overwhelmingly black. She emphasized thinking about legislative options to ensure black interests were well represented, even when they weren't in the majority. She promoted the idea of cumulative voting in a case where you might have the same number of votes as there are seats, which gives people the option to distribute their votes in ways that they want. Maybe you concentrate your votes for one person. You can also have multi-member districts rather than single-member districts. These were systems that operated, for example, in the state of Illinois for a number of years in the 20th century. So thinking about talking about these people, I wrote this out, presented it, but also realized it wasn't quite as much about their personalities, their liveliness, their commitment to uh, recognition of the need for um, strengthening the right to vote, their willingness to work, to think, to press for it, to think in innovatively. They were really civil rights workers in the Hill, in Congress, um, in the Civil Rights Coalition, helping those groups think about, think differently about how uh, voting rights might operate. They weren't always successful, but they weren't afraid to try for that, those changes. Parker stayed in the litigative arena uh, for most of the rest of his career, although he began to teach in the 1990s, first at the District of Columbia School of Law, also at American University, and Washington and Lee University at the time of his death uh, in 1997, when he was about 55. His 1991 book on this work was called Black Votes Count and won multiple awards. Guineer's uh, subsequent 
um, years were more volatile. President Clinton nominated her uh, for the position of Assistant Attorney General to lead the De Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. But her candidacy was subjected to extensive attacks from her ideas as well as her persona. She was attacked as a supporter of quotas, even though her ideas on cumulative voting in multi-member districts were actually an effort to move away from majority black districts. Clinton withdrew her nomination. Guineer taught at the University of Pennsylvania Law School for a decade and then joined the Harvard Law School in 1998 as the first black woman on their faculty. She published several books, The Tyranny of the Majority, uh, and another, The Miner's Canary, Rethinking Race and Power. She's become less active in recent years. As I understand, she's suffering from Alzheimer's. These were remarkable people whose ideas have shaped my own thinking for some time. At Notre Dame, in my classrooms, in my interactions with students, I talk about their work. I talk about the kinds of uh, approaches they've used to civil rights reform. They're, those two individuals inspire me today and kind of ground my assumptions about the way in which you think about voting rights politics. Although I didn't recognize it when I first met them in the early 1980s, they were powerful thinkers, extraordinarily hard workers who helped strengthen the foundations for political change. I'm happy to have had the chance to share their legacies with you for Father Ted said. Thank you. <laughs>